Proverbs chapter 23, 24, chapter 24, pardon me. Verse, and by understanding it is established, and by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant platform that brings to birth and something goes wrong with your marriage your home is in shambles big question I'm not talking about the world interestingly it was not the world that originated marriage it was not the world perspective what is marriage I'm going to give what I call my own biblical definition of marriage and I'll be asking you to say it after me everybody can we say marriage is a covenant relationship between a man and a woman from different family background I'm not hearing you again talking as young people I'm going to start all over again. I want to hear your voice. Marriage is a covenant relationship between a man and a woman from different family background who are joined together meant to be sealed by blood and separable only by death. Or I should say it again. All right, let's go together. Marriage is a covenant relationship between a man and a woman from different family background who are joined together to fulfill God's purpose in a covenant meant to be sealed by blood and separable only by death. Can we say it together now? Want to go? Marriage is a covenant relationship between a man and a woman from different family background who are joined together in a covenant meant to be sealed by blood and separable only by death. Let me prophesy to your life that as the Lord God lived before whom I stand, this matter of marriage, you will get it right. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Now we say your marriage and your future. When we talk about your future, what does it mean? You know that future could mean two things. Future could mean the time to come. The time to come. But sometimes in the usage of language, future could also mean what you will become in time to come. So sometimes you hear somebody say, this person doesn't have a future. Let me begin by first announcing to you, your future is great. Did I hear somebody say louder, amen? I declare again, I say your future is great. When Pastor ba Tunde Bakari was speaking to us, and I was looking around, Something was coming to my heart. There are future presidents sitting in this meeting. Are they here? There are future governors of states sitting here. There are future ministers sitting here. 
future commissioner sitting here. Local government chairman sitting here. And I prophesy, whether the devil like it or not, what the Lord has caught you out to be in future. And you know, future begins from tomorrow. No devil will be able to stand against it. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Now, what is the connection between your marriage and your future? And I want you to note. You know, when we talk about future, it's a point in time. We could also have spoken about the past. We can also talk about the present. And then we talk about the future. Your past. Your present. And then your future. Let me turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, your past has become a lesson note. Say it to your neighbor again. Or what the teachers we call teaching head. And so the first matter I want you to note, as you are listening to me this morning, it does not matter how your past has been. I want to declare to you, you have a glorious future. So help me tell your neighbor, keep the past in the past. You can only learn lesson from them. Uh -huh. don't, don't let your past hold you down. I say a lot of young people, why they can't make progress in marriage, why they can't make progress in life, is because they have had bad past experiences. And the bad past is holding you down. Can I invite you to look at the book of Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 and 19. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 and 19. What did God say there? He said, remember not the former things. Neither consider the things of old. He said, Behold, I'm going to do a new thing. And now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Prophesy to three people and say you will rise above your past. Prophesy to them. I see you rising above your past. Yes, that's why you have come to arise. Arise. It doesn't matter what the past has been. Let your past just be a lesson note. From, but then, what is your present? Help me tell your neighbor, your present is a seed. No, say it to your neighbor very loud and clear. So, as you are living your life in the present, what are you doing? You are sowing seed. Tell your neighbor, your future is the fruit. We determine your future harvest. I want to repeat myself. Whatever great future you may have, great destiny, the seed that you sow now into your marital life 
will determine the harvest that you will have in the future. So, as the Lord helps me to share with us, grace to sow the right seed into your marriage that your future may not be damaged. Receive that grace in the name of Jesus Christ. Why is this key in our hearts? It is key because your marriage will either make your future to be a reality or your marriage will mar your future. And I wish you could may prophesy to two people and say your marriage will not mar you. Your marriage will make you. Can you prophesy to another person? There are examples in the Bible. People that it was their marriage that marred their future. People that it was also their marriage that made the future to happen. One of them that his marriage marred his future was the man called Solomon, the king of Israel. You will know that Solomon started very well. In 1 Kings chapter 3, we saw how the Bible says that Solomon loved God. He loved the Lord. He wanted to serve God. He wanted to please God. All he wanted was to fulfill the purpose of God. And when God said, ask me anything, after he had given so much offerings and sacrifices to God, all he was going to ask God for was wisdom to fulfill the purpose of God. Unfortunately, marriage marred his future. In 1 Kings chapter 11, 1 Kings chapter 11. I wanted to hear what the scripture says about him. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Etites of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. But the Bible now says, Solomon clave unto this in love. Everybody says, Solomon clave. Can I hear you say it very loud? Choir, borrow me one of you. One of you, come, come, drop your things and come. One of you, come. The Bible says, Solo, everybody says, Solomon, clave. Oh, young people, can you shout it? Solomon did what? Solomon did what? Now, even when they will be telling Solomon that, hey, these ladies you are cleaving to, they are dangerous. This man, God said you should not marry them. You know what I hear Solomon say? I'm in love. I'm in love. I can't stop loving her. It's like we are born together. I'm in love. Solomon cliff. What does he mean to cliff? To cliff is to hold on to tightly that you are not ready to let go. Solomon claimed to run people in marriage. If the person sitting next to you is yet to marry, 
help me face the person. If the person is yet to marry, face the person. Help me ask that person, who is cleaving to you now? I hope you are not cleaving to a wrong person. If you are cleaving to a wrong person, break up! Shout it, break up! <laughs> Why must you break up? You need to break up so that you do not jeopardize your future. Solomon claimed to run people. And as you study the Bible, the next thing you will see in verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, was that the Bible says, They turned his heart away from God. And his heart was not perfect when the Lord is God. God also, because of what his marriage led him into, had to tear his kingdom apart. Your marriage and your future. Can I please beg you on this matter of marriage? Don't miss it. For your marriage has a lot to do in determining what happens in your future. Let me leave Solomon. Look at King Ahab. Each time I read 1 Kings chapter 21 verse 25, I feel like weeping for that man. 1 Kings chapter 21 verse 25. When I read and the Bible says, And there was no one who sold himself out completely to do evil like unto Ahab. Who was being pushed? Who was being steered? Who was being engineered to do evil? By who? By his wife. I said, wow. In my heart, I said, maybe Ahab would have done well. Maybe Ahab would have done better. But he has missed it in marriage. He married Jezebel, the daughter of Edbaal. Edbaal was like the head of all the Baal priests. So she brought all Baal worship into Israel and messed up the great privilege that God has given to Ahab. My heart prays for somebody in this meeting. Whoever you will marry that will destroy your destiny, may you never marry that person. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. If you are currently moving with the person, may the Lord separate you by fire. In the name of Jesus. Your marriage is critical to your future. In our contemporary society, I've come across people with great, great vision, people with great mission, and I've seen how marriage has destroyed everything in their hands, including clergies. Marriage. Pastors have been driven out of pastoral and out of pastorate. When the church comes and says, look, the wife is a witch. The wife is wicked. And marriage has terminated great destinies. 
But you see, I need to let you also know that when you get it right in marriage, your marriage may become an enhancement to the fulfillment of the purpose of God for your life. While I was studying the scriptures, I came across a man like Moses. I know all of us know about Moses. Can I ask us, everybody, did Moses marry? Eh? Did he marry? What was the name of his wife? Eh? Sipora. Does it bother you that the world over, people speak so much about Moses, but we talk less about Sipora? But can I announce to you, as I study Exodus chapter 4, and I read from verse 17, I discover that Moses wouldn't have achieved all that God had cut him out to fulfill without that woman, Sephora. You know, the scripture spoke about how Moses, as he was ready to obey the voice of the Lord, he took his wife and he took his two sons and put them upon an ass. And then they started traveling. And when they came to an inn, the Bible records that Moses, because it was late in the night, and his wife and children, they decided to stay in that inn for the night. And the scripture says, while they were there, the Lord appeared unto him and wanted to slay him. Can I ask you people of God, who sent him on assignment? Talk to me very loud and clear. Who wanted to kill him? Do you know that inside that inn or guest house, that's where Moses would have died. And that's where the great future would have been truncated. Those of you that study the Bible, who did not allow God to kill him? Eh? It was the wife. Whereas Moses was running elter skelter inside that room, and the angel of the Lord was coming with the sword, wanting to slay him. And Moses was doing, Yeah, yeah, what have I done? Yeah, yeah. The wife woke up. Moses did not know why God wanted to kill him. It was the woman who had spiritual perception. Who has spiritual understanding? Who quickly knew that God wanted to kill her husband because her husband wanted to do the work of God in disobedience? They had not circumcised their second son. The Bible says the woman rose up immediately and she looked for a sharp stone and quickly with the sharp stone she circumcised the boy. And as she circumcised the boy, the first king with blood that was flowing on it, she threw it at the feet of her husband. And when the Lord saw that the covenant of circumcision had been fulfilled, the Bible says that God left Moses and allowed him to go. Can I ask you, if that woman was not there, what would have happened to Moses? Whew. Can I also ask you, if Moses had married a woman who does not understand spiritual principle, what would have happened? It would be a dead man. Can I also ask you, if Moses had married a woman who does not have initiative, who doesn't know what to do, what would have happened to Moses? Can I also ask you, if Moses had married an irrational woman, because you know some women can be irrational, that 
now she knew why God wanted to kill her husband. Did you notice that the wife of Moses did not first talk to Moses? She first went ahead and rendered solution to the problem. But you know, if it were to be some of our women, the first thing would be to be telling the husband, uh -huh, you are running up and down now. Do you know why they want to kill you? And if I talk, you will say, woman does not know anything. Woman does not know anything. Keep running, keep running, keep running. What would happen to Moses? Whew. But she was not a woman that was petty. She was not petty. She knew that I need to take action. And she took immediate action. And Moses was spared. Now today all of us are talking about how Moses lifted up his rod and frog came, he lifted up his rod and flies came, he lifted up his rod and nobody talks about that woman. My heart prays for you. The person that's supposed to accompany you in the journey of marriage for your destiny to be fulfilled, may your path cross. May your path cross. In the mighty name of Jesus. We can go on and on to buttress the fact that marriage can enhance your fulfillment of destiny. But the big question that I desire to ask is if my marriage will give me a fulfilled future because like I said I just have this conviction in my heart that for you to make this year's meeting the first of its kind your future is great oh my god I say your future is great Maybe you want to sing together with me. It is wonderful and is bright. I must get there. It is wonderful and is bright. I must get there. My, My future, future is bright. I must get there. My future is bright. I must get there. It is colorful and is bright. I must get there. It is colorful and is bright. I must get there. I know my future is bright. I must get there. I know my future is bright. I must get there. It is colorful and is bright. I must. It is colorful and is bright. I know my future is bright. I say my future is bright. I must get there. Now, if marriage has the potential to either help you to get there or stop you from getting there, then what do you need to do? And that is where I want to spend the remaining time. What do you need to do? And number one that I will be dealing with is for those of you that are here to marry. And I say, lay a correct foundation. Say to your neighbor that is here to marry, lay a correct foundation. Say to your neighbor very loud and clear, lay a correct foundation. You know what is in Psalms 11 verse 3? Psalms 11 verse 3. If the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? A lot of marriages that you are seeing today, where there is so much crying and weeping and gnashing of teeth, is as a result of the foundation. You know that the future of a building 
is principally predicated on the foundation of that building. Yet there could be several other factors that the strength of materials, like the expertise of the builders, but it is first primarily predicated on the foundation of the building. So as you dream about entering into marriage, I want to challenge you. Lay a solid foundation for your marriage. I know that if you do, when other homes are crashing and crumbling, your own cannot crumble. You remember that Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, from verse 24 to 27, spoke about the wise man that built and the foolish man that built. And he said, Behold, rain fell, and the flood came, and the wind blew on both buildings. What made the house of the foolish man to fall was the foundation. What made the house of the wise man to stand was also the foundation. So can I challenge you? Build on the right foundation. And if you're going to build on the right foundation, you know when I read from the book of Proverbs chapter 24, verses 3 and 4, Three key things were given to us that were very critical. And you're going to say them after me. Everybody say knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Can we say them again? Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. One of the things that our fathers and mothers in the Lord have done for us in this meeting why they brought this particular session is to give you knowledge. Knowledge. Ignorance is a disease. Ignorance is a killer. You need knowledge. But you cannot get knowledge if you are not instructed. Knowledge comes through series of instructions. And if you're going to have knowledge, then you must have teachable spirit. You are not proud. You are not pompous. You are not arrogant. You are willing to learn. Knowledge comes through series of instructions. Knowledge comes as you are getting informed. I think it was Bishop Oyedepo that said, if you are not informed, you will be deformed. You need knowledge. And as we're going to be sharing, the Lord is going to be imparting some knowledge. But know that knowledge comes through instructions. So the instructions God is going to be giving to us now, please sink them in. But you know it is one thing for you to know something. It's another thing for you to understand it. That's why understanding becomes important. And then we know that wisdom is now the application of the knowledge that we have. So what do you need to know if you are going to lay a solid foundation for yourself? I will quickly mention about three or four things for the unmarried people so that I can talk a little to those who are in marriage. What do you need to know? Number one, if the person sitting close to you is not married, help me tell the person right away, lesson one, don't marry a non-believer. No, say it to the person very loud and clear. Help me tell the person that in Christianity, marriage is not a means of evangelism. Abi, I think it's only in Islam. You know why I want to say to that? Sometimes I talk to some leaders. And one of them said to me one day and said, Well, excuse me, sir. Um, 
the person that is coming is not a Christian, as in is a Muslim. So I'm thinking that I can marry him to change him. <laughs> Help me tell your neighbor, you are not the changer. It is the only spirit that changes people. Don't become a marriage evangelist who want to convert a soul through marriage. Solomon could not convert those women. They converted him. Make up your mind. You're not going to marry an unbeliever. Second Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. Second Corinthians 6 14. He says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. There's no fellowship between light and darkness. No union between Christ and Belial. But can I ask a very big question now? Unbelievers, are they only outside the church or they are also inside the church? Can I hear you very loud? Can a deacon's son be an unbeliever? Ah. Can a pastor's daughter be an unbeliever? Yeah. Can a son of a reverend doctor be an unbeliever? The way you are saying yes, have you met them? Ah, Mugbe. <laughs> Help me tell your neighbor, there are unbelievers in the church. They may be in the choir. They may know how to play drum sets. <laughs> I want you to make up your mind. You know why this is, this is, this is serious in my heart. Myself and my wife, we went for a meeting. And a woman was crying. And she, when my wife said, what is the problem? She said, I regret marrying my husband. My husband is a stark unbeliever. I said, Madam, you have been married for many years? She said, five years. I said, when did you get to know that your husband is not born again? She said, two days before the wedding. Two days. If you are the one, what will you do? Two days. What about the cow? <laughs> Two days. Now she's been in the marriage for five years. She was crying. When I asked her, how did you decide to marry a man that is not a child of God, that is not born again, that doesn't know God? She said, I thought he was a child of God. I said, what made you to think? Hear me now. She said, his father is a deacon. Number two, himself was the RA coordinator for our association.
who did not know God. Listen. Listen. Tell your neighbor, don't be deceived. There's a difference between religiosity and spirituality. Make up your mind. Let me prophesy to your life. You will marry correctly. Every wolf in sheep clothing that may come your way, God will expose them. In the name of Jesus. So number one, wisdom, make up your mind, you will not marry an unbeliever. Number two, don't build your marriage on the foundation of sexual immorality. Don't build your marriage on the foundation of sexual immorality. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse 13, the Bible says, food for the belly, and the belly for food, but God shall destroy both it and them. He now said, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord. Help me turn to your neighbor and say, this is your fine body. No be for fornication. Now for the Lord. Stop nonsense. The body is not for fornication. The body is for the Lord. So when you study 1 Corinthians chapter 6, when you get to verse 18, verse 18 says, flee fornication. Everybody say flee. flee. What does it mean to flee? <laughs> flee means run as if you are flying. Run as you are running. You do like this. <laughs> Hallelujah. When you flee, you are running as if you are flying. If God says flee fornication, it means that fornication is dangerous. More dangerous than AK-47 rifle. Flee! Whoever comes into a relationship with you and is asking for sex is an agent of Satan. Run! And you know we are living in a very terrible generation. A generation where if the man does not ask for sex, it is the lady that will be saying, um, Shagun, 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 how many times did I call you? I don't understand you. As in, you are very dry. <laughs> so, even when the man does not want to do, you see the lady pushing him. If there's anybody that is under my voice and you have been under the yoke of fornication before you leave this camp that you have come you are delivered in the name of Jesus. Don't build on the foundation of immorality. Number three. Number three. 
If you're going to lay a solid foundation, I said pray for God's guidance. Pray for God's guidance. Pray for God's leadership. Pray for God's direction. I know that as young people, one of the challenges that we have is that we are listening to different, different preachers. And different preachers are preaching different things. There are people that preach to us and they say, Hallelujah, praise the name of Jesus. You don't need God to tell you who you're going to marry. You are the one that knows the person that fits your life. And that's why you're supposed to shine your eyes. Come on, give your neighbor five and say, shine your eyes. Then we say, Pastor, ride on, ride on. What is Pastor riding? And where is he riding you to? Pray! Pray! What a... Yoruba hymn singer. The man said, The word Badura Koma Badura the man said pray so that you not be going from one mountain to another so pray Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 to verse 7 Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 to verse 7 don't be carried away with your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge God. Seek His will. Like the New Living Translation put verse 6. It says, seek His will in all that you do. And it will direct your path. So pray. Let God lead you. Let me tell you this. Do you know that my wife will not have married me? Uh -huh. You want to know why? In 1996... When I went to propose to her, that I would love to marry her, my wife simply did, hmm. she said, give me time to pray about it. I said, no problem. I left her. I went back again about two months later. I said, Madam Prayer Warrior, have you prayed? What did the Lord say? She did another. Hmm. She now said, precisely a year ago, she said, I was not dreaming. I was standing at, so she described where she was standing. She said, I saw you. You were going towards, she described where I was going. She said, you did not see me because you were backing me. You were even moving very, very fast. But as I was looking at you, something said to my heart, that is your husband. <laughs> listen, listen, just listen. Listen, listen. She said... But that day, I said, no, I don't want a short man. I don't want a short man. <laughs> I don't want a short man. Help me tell your neighbor, you better pray. Let God lead you. Let God guide you. Today, my wife can look back and she can smile. <laughs> <laughs> when we travel together when we travel together and people that have not known her and that have known me very well when they see me and you know how they run they say hey reverend 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 and because we wear the same dress they say yeah 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 is this the mama? Hey, mama! Then they hold that they say you are 
I tell you, love you. I just whisper to my wife. I say, short man, short man. You need to pray. You need God to lead you. You need God to guide you. Let me pray for every one of you. The Lord will lead you. The Lord will direct you. You will not miss the counsel of God for your life. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. How do you lay a solid foundation? Take the last one. So that I can say a few things to those who are married. Take the last one. I said seek pastoral guidance. Let me tell your neighbor that one. Seek pastoral guidance. Oh, one of the errors of young people in this generation is that we enter into relationship. We don't carry our pastors along. It is when we want to do introduction. Or even after you have done introduction, the pastor will get to know. And when I ask some of them, some will say, Daddy, excuse me, sir. What concerns pastor? <laughs> is it pastor that is going to live our life for us? I beg, who did pastor tell before I marry soon? <laughs> who did pastor tell? Carry your pastor along. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15. Why did God give pastors to us? Jeremiah three fifteen. God said, I will give you pastors after my heart. Who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Now, if we say we need knowledge, according to Proverbs chapter 24, verse 3 and 4, we need knowledge to build our home, we need wisdom, we need understanding. And God said, I will give you pastors. And the pastors are there to feed you with knowledge and understanding. Please, don't run away from your pastor. Can I ask you this big question? If somebody enters into marriage and the person is having a problem, it is well. <laughs> That's all right. Listen. If somebody enters into marriage and the person is having a problem, who will the person run to? He's still pastor. So can I please beg you? Carry your pastors along. They can cancel you. Old Testament will describe pastors as overseers. Because God has put them in a vantage position to see things that you may not see. So they can cancel you. They can advise you so that you don't run into trouble. I will decree over your life it shall be well with you. Your future will be great. In the name of Jesus Christ. Those who are already in marriage, wherever you are, wave your hand. Let me see them. You are married. The married people. All right. So you are plenty. Hallelujah. Your marriage will be a blessing. Listen to me now. All the married people. I said your today or your present is a seed. That determines your harvest in the future. So the summary of what I want to say to those who are already married. Is that you should sow correct seed into your marriage. So, into your marriage. You know when the Bible says, so unto yourself in righteousness and reap in mercy. It is what you sow that you're going to reap. So for the married, you may ask me this question. What should I sow into my marriage so that my future can come to fulfillment? I can just mention to you in the next few minutes that I have. I said, number one, so love into your marriage. Love your husband. Love your wife. 
love I beg you when there is no love in marriage marriage runs dry love and I can't talk to you about that because if I want to talk about that then I'll be talking about how do you love your wife erotically I would have been talking about how do you love your wife as a friend, Philia. I would have been talking about how do you love your wife with the love that is called storage, the love for the family. I would have been talking about how do you love her with the agape love, the God kind of love. But I want to challenge you. Love your wife. Love your husband. And can I challenge our men in particular? Please love your wife. I have discovered that the security of a man in his old age is his wife. I have discovered that the security of a man in the time of sickness is also who? Is his wife. I've seen a lot of people on sick bed who dies because they did not show love to their wife. Their wives abandoned them. Please love your wife. You know Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 said it clearly. Husbands, love your wife. Titus chapter 2 verse 4 said that women should be taught how to love their own husbands. So love your husband and love your wife. Number two, what seed do you sow into your marriage? Sow the seed of submission. Sow the seed of of submission and i put it in a very simple way i said in your marriage submit to your head submit to your head if a married man is sitting close to you help me look at him don't look at me now look at him look at one married man tell him mr head remember that you too have head According to First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, it says, The head of every man is who? Is Christ. One of the reasons why we have so much problem in marriage is that our marriages are filled with men who are demanding that their wives should submit to them when they don't submit to their own head. A woman will naturally not struggle to submit to a man who submits to his own head. So can I challenge all the married men that are here? Go home and submit to Christ. What Christ will not do, don't do it. What Christ will not approve, don't do it. For he is your head. Can I challenge the women? Submit. To your husband you know when i read that first corinthians 11 verse 3 and he said the head of every man is christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of christ is god god expect that the woman will submit to the man the man will submit to christ when you sow the seed of submission into your marriage oh what a beauty will come in your home and can i challenge all the women that are married here no matter your level of education no matter your wealth no matter your social position no matter your family background please submit to your husband that is where your strength lies that is what will give you joy in your marriage what do you sow into your marriage number three i said sow the seed of unbroken communication sow the seed of unbroken communication husband and wife should continue to talk together somebody said communication is the blood of marriage that when it ceases marriage dies when you're no longer talking together you're going to kill your marriage so husband and wife must be sitting together talk together rub your minds together share your fears share your pains share your joys share your dreams share your vision share together keep talking together keep communicating if there are marriages here where communication line has been broken may the lord reconnect it 
In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. What do you sow? Sow the seed of forgiveness. Sow the seed of forgiveness. Offenses will come. But we must forgive ourselves. Thank you. Offenses will come. Forgive your wife. Forgive your husband. When I was sent into marriage, I didn't have anybody to tell me that offenses will come in marriage. Then I married my wife. And the first offense my wife committed. And the first offense I also committed. It was as we were sleeping. My wife, he put down her hand like this. For me to sleep on it. As I sleep on it, she will use the second hand to hug me. And within three minutes, she will sleep off. But me, if you hold me, I cannot sleep. What a great offense. Uh -uh. So, I will be thinking in my heart, Oh God, what type of bondage have I entered now? Let this woman leave me, she will not leave me. Until 2 o'clock in the night, when she wants to turn, she will release me. I will now say, Lord, let your servant depart in perfect peace. Then I start my home sleeping. Until one day, as we were going to bed, I said, the kingdom of God suffered violence. And the violence take it by force. Today is the day of my deliverance. <laughs> Listen to me. Offenses will come. When my wife held me like that, when I knew she slept off, I now carry her hand. I put it down. As I want to roll away from the one I was lying on, the one I put down, she brought it back. I now waited for a very long time. Then I carried her hand again. And as I wanted to put it down, she said, what happened? I said that what? She said that I cannot hold you. I said because one person is sleeping, another person cannot sleep. My wife said, I expect you to understand. I said, understand what? She said, in the night, I normally feel hot. But once I hold you, your body cools me down. <laughs> Listen, I now told her, I said, I said, but your body is eating me up. I was feeling offended. She was feeling offended. But we thank God. We were able to resolve the matter. <laughs> Rise up, let us pray. Don't ask me how. <laughs> You like gist. <laughs> Your marriage shall be a blessing. Dreams around your table. You, you will, will see your children's children. children the the same. Same. Amen. Amen. Just two prayer points. I want you to say, Father, every satanic arrangement to lead me into error I cancel it now open your mouth and pray in the name of Jesus every satanic arrangement to lead me into error I cancel it I erase it I wipe it off my future must be great my future must be colorful. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we are prayed. Come on, say, Father. My marriage will be a blessing that will give me a fulfilled future. Come on, say, Father. My marriage will be a blessing 
that will give me a fulfilled future. Open your mouth and pray it. Oh, thank you, Father. The marriage of Moses brought him to fulfillment. He prophesied to all our lives. So shall it be. In Jesus' awesome name, we have prayed. As you have prayed, so will the Lord do unto you. And you will have great testimonies. In Jesus' name, we have prayed.